Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 289 of the Agostino Zynga Show. That's dos, ocho, nuevo, dos, ocho, nuevo. Como estas, mi amigos? Bien. Bien. How am I doing? Pretty well. Not bad. Okay. I don't know what those words in Spanish are, so you're not going to get that from me. Hope you guys are doing well. Hope you guys are doing good. This is a special bonus weekend episode of the show for you guys heading into your weekend or you're already in your weekend. Now you're probably woken up now on a Saturday and you've kind of got a bit of a foggy head. You don't know where you are. You're confused. You're you're bewildered. You're angry. You're frustrated and all those things in between. I'm here to soothe your issues and make you calm down. Hope you guys are doing well. I'm doing great. I'm doing fine. Hope your Saturday goes okay. Um, what do I want to talk about today? So loads today to talk about some DJ news, some interviews, some stuff about trainers and stuff about clothing. We're going to sprinkle it all in between and some other things on the top of it. As per usual, if you're watching this stuff via YouTube, then please like smash that like button down below hit subscribe leave me a comment if you're listening via the podcast app why not leave me a five-star review and share the show with your friends so everyone can find out what it's about and then we're going to keep on going keep on trucking keep on speaking and go from there so here i am excellent show episode number 288 um it's saturday morning hope you guys are feeling good and feeling fresh um what am i going to do today most of my day is going to be spent running and doing push-ups and stuff and you know just generally doing what i do but i also might go out this weekend there's a few um really good events on at the moment that i've kind of spotted on the old resident advisor that we're going to quickly go through some stuff that i think might be of interest to some of you guys who are going out this weekend um i might go out to this place called um venue one of what the venue mot venue 105 mot i forgot what it's called it's somewhere in south london let me see if i can find it up here it's similar to like, the cause it looks like kind of in terms of layout in terms of approach in terms of yeah in terms of layout and approach and programming it looks similar to the cause but i think it's based in south london let me quick see if i can check get it up on here it's a sick da, 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 where is it oh, da, da, da. it's not on here it's a lot, why isn't it listed on there for let me see if i can get it up on here venue it's called like venue i think they do a lot of um i think they do a lot of uh boiler rooms there as well mot 105 something venue is it what's it called let me see if I can find it. Venue. M- it's a MOT unit one there. So I can find it there. It's on Facebook. It's on Resident Advisor. Saturday they've got an event. And then I think the one I wanted to go to was I think the one on Friday, which is only listed on the Facebook, I think. So let me see if I can check it up on here. But this is a place I'm talking about anyway. So I can just get up on the screen for you guys to see. It's got a similar sort of like dystopian sort of like underground Grease Mueller sort of like vibe that um, the cause has. Maybe it's run by the same people. I'm not too sure. But this is what it kind of looks like. Hopefully you can see it up in the screen. All right. There it is right there. Can you see that? Hopefully you can. All right. Hopefully you can see that. Can you? Hopefully you can. Yep. You can see that. So that's 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 where it's situated. Nice low ceilings. They've got like a, I think they've got the iconic sort of cage that kind of encapsulates the DJ booth. I think that's the one, right? Is it the same one? I think so. It might be the same one. Let's double check and see the events that they have coming up at the moment. Get that off the screen first of all. And then we can go through the Facebook so I can show you exactly what the vibe is. Yeah, let's see here. Oh, let's click on the venue on Facebook and see what they've got planned. But I'm sure there's an event I saw on there for the Friday. It might be, oh, you know, it might be actually. Um, I think it's a World Unknown. World Unknown, I think, is happening on the Friday at Venue 1 or whatever that thing is called it. I'm pretty sure that's what I saw. Or maybe something else. But there's an event happening at the moment at this venue, MOT, venue MOT Unit 18 and 20. I'm pretty sure Boiler Room have done a few events there. So that's happening this weekend. Um... I'm just checking the Facebook now. And of course, they've got the event listed on here. They've got the six. They've got World Unknown. It's happening next tomorrow or tonight. Basically. Well, yeah, what well, happened yesterday, basically. Um, then they've got Distant Planet happening this today on Saturday. So, yeah, check that out if you're that way inclined. And then what else do I have listed on my list here? I have... Oh, I don't want anything else, actually. So let's have a look at the actual listings and see what's actually happening. Because I don't have actually anything listing on it. I think because I was away at Berlin, I probably just had my eyes set on that in general. But let's see what events we have going on in London this weekend. Uh, we have Annie Mac Presents. Um, so that should be a pretty good one. Um, it's a little bit commercial, don't get me wrong. But, you know, Annie, Annie Mac is probably one of our best hybrids when it comes to a person who can play on like a regular drive time radio show. 
right? And and get your feet, you know, tapping on the floor. I imagine if I had a car and Ali Mike was playing whilst I was on my way back from work, I'd be skanking. Do you know what I mean? I might get involved in some kind of accident, which I, of course, wouldn't blame on her and I blame it on my own reckless behavior. But I think she has that weird and canny ability, which I think is very much. Um, uh, very much a, a flipping um i would say it's a, a good illustration of just why i think in general overall uk djs are probably better than anyone else in the world i think because we have that um history of growing up on radio of growing up with radio disc jockeys who at the beginning of someone like john peel right that was a that was a weird era right he was john peel essentially was able to do like an nts show on like a national syndicated radio station right that's what he was able to do he was able to play the most obscure shit and mix it in with some commercial pop stuff that he found that he thought was good and still have the um, draw to pull in all the underground fans, all the chin strokers and still be appealing to like the casual fans too. So that's probably a good inspiration of it. And I think that kind of schooling of being able to play. And also I think because of the time constraints too, because most of our bars and pubs, we don't have the ability to play longer sets like, you know, some of our European counterparts. We have to get really good at being concise and at being precise and at packing in as much as you can into an hour, an hour and a half or maybe sometimes max two hours you've got in a set. So we come with the noise. We don't fuck around. We don't just warm up and play, you know, some ambient stuff or play some sound stuff or some white noise or some random, you know, really uh, um, avant-garde jazz track. We have to come really hard. So I guess because of that, or come really hard, that sounds really mad, but whatever, we keep on going. I think because of that, once we go and book, once UK DJs get booked in other places around the world, I think that's why we're able to adapt a lot easier than others because we have that experience of, okay, number one, we can play warm we can play warm-up sets when no one's around we can play we have the experience of playing you know underground radio sets with for like you know a group of our friends we have the experience of playing in bars and pubs around the country where no one gives a shit who you are you have the experience of playing in some of the best clubs in the world and you have the experience of also playing around the world so you got all that experience worked into one person and it makes complete sense so i think that's why that experience has in my opinion made uk DJs the number one in the world but anyway any mac presents the lineup is happening there some print works which is obviously you know one of our biggest and best venues we have in london at the moment I would say best one of our bigger venues in London. Uh, I think the capacity is way high. I will, I'm looking. I'm probably going to say probably in the thousands. Is it in the thousands or in the five hundreds? It must be in the thousands, isn't it? Printworks. It's huge, huge, huge space. I still haven't been actually, but it looks incredible from the pictures. Um, so far, fourth release tickets, thirty-seven fifty plus four fifty um, booking fee. Lineup um, main people. I guess you got there are Annie Mac, Disclosure, and DJ Seinfeld. Disclosure will be good to see because they just dropped that new EP, which is a bit underwhelming, isn't it? Is it only me? I thought that new EP was a tad underwhelming. Um, again, I'm not sure. I've always had, I've always been of the opinion, like people like Disclosure, who are insanely talented at making music, who are kind of like savants, right? Like prodigy, child, child prodigies for better, for lack of a better term, right? They, they remind me of like the, they're like a newer version of that, the Martinez brothers, right? They started off playing and making music when they were bloody eight years old and shit. I think that people like that, especially when they're maybe coached or managed by their managed like by their parents or by family members who have obviously noticed their talent i think it's better when the parents or the family don't give a shit and they only care when you blow up i think once your career has been managed really closely by a select group of people and a small team when you're really young it makes it makes it unlikely that once you get older the music improves it, it usually kind of flatlines it gets a bit stale and i think maybe this goes in a bit of a stale period because that ep was really forgetful um, and I was really looking forward to it. I'm a big Disclosure fan. Like, I'm one of the people that actually, you know, again, I don't care how popular or poppy someone is. If they make good tracks, they make good tracks. It is what it is. But I wasn't really feeling any of the tracks on that new EP. But again, I think it'll be good to see them live. Uh, DJ Seinfeld, of course, who always does well in that kind of space. He's probably one of the better people that kind of doing that sort of like festival-y kind of uh, bigger nightclub-y kind of audience, which print works at tracks, right? Um, I would assume so. So... He would do pretty well there. And then uh, I think in the other place, Music Factory, you've got um, uh, Adelphi Music Factory, you've got Jaguar, Leopold, Lose Nightmares on Wax, who I obviously know, Night Flate, I don't, Route 94, I don't either. So definitely check that out if you're that way inclined. It's probably one of the better places to go to in London because, again, as you saw in the lineup, it opens at 7 and closes at 2. It's completely pitch black in there. You have no idea what's going on the outside. You get out at 2 a.m., you still have a chance to get an, on a central line or get on a you know Jubilee line and head home. So all is good there. So that was one. What else you have here? You have um you have Oliver Collective and Superflu playing at Fabric, I don't know, and Groom, sorry. You have Shogun Audio playing at Still Yard. You have Dusky again, the the residency. I think it's about to end soon, right? Playing X O Wire. Whenever they put tickets on door on the on the headline, you know they haven't sold that many, so 
Again, I, I probably wouldn't want that if I was a DJ. It probably cheapens your night a little bit. Um, you've got Campier and Buku Buku um, playing at the Jazz Cafe. That should be good. Head to that's that's RA's pick there. They head to Jazz Cafe for a night of celebrating the finest Afro beats, UK funky and fresh cup sounds. You don't really hear that too much. Do you? Remember that that was a big thing when I used to promote parties back in the day at the Alibi, um and other places around Dawson. One of the main things that we used to do was kind of get a lot of the UK funky dudes in, a lot of the grand guys, a lot of the garage guys. It was really fun because they create quite. They I think that that's the best way to really pop off those kind of parties in that kind of area like really fun loose disco some cheesy hip-hop cheesy pop rock stuff like they do at the oh what's my what's one of my favorite dive bars and i forgot the name of it oh damn it ah it's near captain pond what's the fucking name of it called again anyway it doesn't matter but that kind of stuff works really well in london because we don't really have the ability to have like um a whole night and morning's worth of fun we don't have bars that open till seven because at seven in the morning unfortunately so if you're going to have a dj playing it's probably advantageous to have them play some fun party music and you don't get more fun or more party orientated than afro beats uk funky um in that kind of environment so that should be good then the other pick they have here is time dance at village underground with Butu Dini Ab 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 Abdelawid, which we did a really good um, RA um, mix recently, actually. Ploy, Daniel, Alaska, and a few other people. Um, then you've got Box 7 Birthday Party at Corsica. You've got Young Marco playing at Phonics with Jamie Tiller. That should be fucking cool. Young Marco is one of my favorite DJs, a Dutch DJ who has hair, wears a headband and mixes, plays a lot of vinyl and, and, and uh, on CDJs as well. Um, loads of cool kind of like um electro -y, kind of new disco -y, kind of indie dancey like stuff that he mixes in I, I think he's quite similar to Gerd Jansen his approach young Marco again a very underrated DJ in the scene um you've got materials at code code nine playing at CLF Art Cafe uh drum and bass all stars wow that's sold out I suppose but E1 Mamma Mia that's really good isn't it drum and bass is one of those kind of undercut under under um, underappreciated genres maybe something similar to like trance that's kind of heard of it, a resurgence drum and bass nights do really well there's still a core fan base of drum and bass fans who just go to the nights out when they all the big players get booked they don't give a flying toss they'll go they'll buy a ticket and they'll re relive all the glory years like i'm obviously not listening to drum and bass anymore as i did when i was younger but it's cool to see the kids still give a shit about it um then, then you've got axon wax and what's record playing at mix so quite a few interesting nights happening. You've got Leighton Stone Ballroom. Oh, okay. You've got Inkling Room presents Patton DJ, Graham Dunburn and Moomba. Okay. This is happening at Islington Ballroom. I wonder what that is about. If that's a big deal. Because Islington, Leighton Ballroom is not too far from where I actually live. So that could be a good way to, place to go to. Um, is that like a new, is that a place that they're going to be opening more stuff at? Let's click on the venue and see if there's any more stuff happening there. Yeah, look, we've got, uh, we've got Trojan Records night happening on 21st of March. Okay. That's pretty cool to see. Um, again, it's literally up the road from where I live. It's, I think it's on the. I think it's on. I think it's in the same place where um, where the Red Lion is actually. So I think it's the it's the room up above where they do their all their little club nights in. So that should be pretty cool. So if you live in the East London area, definitely check that out. You've got London something. You celebrate UK sound system culture with London two scene OGs at the Orange Yard, which should be pretty cool as well. Then heading into Saturday, what do we have here? Let's roll down the window and head head into Saturday. We've got Honey D John playing at oh, I'm playing at Village Underground. That's gonna be insane. That's gonna be insane. That's already sold out. I'm pretty sure. Um, tickets will probably be coming, probably be reselling. I guess if you wanna go, um, definitely keep an eye out for tickets. They'll definitely be, um, they'll definitely get added to the resell queue. And and R8 is really good as well with it because when you buy tickets via the R8 app, it has a button where you can immediately just resell it straight away without having any without fucking around so that should be pretty cool so if you're that way inclined definitely go it says honey Dijon presents black girl magic with babes um playing there so jada g sipping tea and eliza rose that should be a fucking immense night uh happening there at village underground so definitely check that out it's open until 6 a.m as well so that's gonna be fucking nuts that's gonna be really really fun um loads of good vibes there if you have if you've ever seen um the honey Dijon's recent honey boiler room set that was outside all the glitter. You know how much of a fucking slayer she is behind the decks. Um, of course, Fabric, you've got the standard incredible night of um, Enzo Siragusa playing all night long. That should be good as well. You've got La Fiesta at the Still Yard. I'm not sure who all these people are, but it's already got 780 people attending. Who's, who's this? La Fiesta at the Boru, at the at Finger. And it's sold out as well at the Still Yard. Who are these people? After purchasing, I was set for start a new decade selling tickets per first week. Why are they putting the amount of tickets they sell there in the description? That's a bit cringe, isn't it? Um, but yeah, okay, that should be cool. I'm assuming this is like a 
a housey sort of night, right? There's someone called a George Mensa. Let's see what let's see what these people look like. Or there, there's someone called Billy Cox. So let's see what their mixes sound like. They got a SoundCloud link. No, he's, he hasn't got a SoundCloud link. How about this guy Bongo Ben? Has he got a SoundCloud link so you can see what they kind of play? I'm assuming it's like yeah, if this hands in the air sort of stuff, it's definitely gonna be your standard like housey stuff. Let's see what it sounds like. Yeah. So if you want to hear that kind of stuff, you know where to go. Sounds standard, isn't it? A little bit standard, a little bit um, a little bit meh. But what can you do? Uh, continue here again. You've got um, obviously that uh, you've got the Soul Train. Oh, Soul Solemn Bass at the um, what do you call it? CLF Art Cafe in the Busy Building, Block A. So um, again, one of my most favourite nights actually to go to in South London. Um, the the Soul Train nights. They're always packed. It's always a good vibe. People get dressed up. They don't take themselves too seriously. They have sometimes they have some live bands as well that play too. Um, loads of percussion stuff. So I remember one time there was a guy playing on sax that was just fucking incredible. So definitely check that out if you want to go there. That that should be a good one. That's always a good time. The Soul Train, uh, South London Soul Train. Sorry, you've got uh, Papa Loco, uh, Revolution with Bane, Simao, and O2 playing at Fold as well. Again, Fold one of my favorite lo- venues in London. That's an easy one to go to as well because they open until six. So definitely check that out if you're that way inclined. And yeah, loads of good vibes. And you got Para Vibe, of course. They do those weird underground um, warehouse parties all around London. So that should be pretty cool. And that's open until 11, 11 to 11. So definitely check that out. I think I'm going to add myself to the guest list on that one as well. So yeah, loads of cool things happening on the weekend. Um, head, check out Resident Advisor as per usual for all your electronic music needs. And I'm sure you'll find something that is in your wheelhouse. So let's move on that one. Boop, 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 boop. What do you want to talk about? Oh, so talking about electronic music again. This is not something to like rag up on because I don't want to, you know, get her piled on and stuff and people to kind of criticize and stuff. But the coronavirus thing has been, you know, kicking off, and I think uh, lately we've heard a lot of people from other industries talking about it more often because obviously it's spread and it's now affecting other parts of the global industry, and people are now being coming more aware of it, I guess, in some respects. Before, because it's like with all things, because you can't be too harsh. You know, I think people are a little bit selfish and a bit self-centered in general. Unless it actually affects you, you don't necessarily care that much, right? So, um, we've got one example of it being uh, this DJ called Nastia, who's quite well known in the electronic music space for being quite vocal about her, you know, feelings and things that she's, you know, going through in the DJ space. And people are being quite receptive to it, right? She she has a bad set. She's the first person to, you know, put a tweet up or put like an Instagram caption up. Um, you know, mad mad amount of um, paragraphs talking about how bad the set was and why she's going to do better next time. And just kind of revealing the other side of the DJing life, isn't it? not just the kind of, oh, here's my hands open up in the air in front of a sold out crowd having a great time. She'll talk about all the highs, all the lows. And the fact that she's a single mom as well adds another kind of um, interesting uh, complex to the issue. An, an interesting um, way to kind of view DJs as well because you don't really hear that kind of story spoken about too often she's a fairly attractive woman too so i think she's had a, a unique set of struggles coming through the industry in that regard um so really it, loads of interesting stuff that i like to kind of um kind of check in from time to time with Nastia. but there's also a part of her that's incredibly self-absorbed and narcissistic in that regard which i guess is not really her fault because i think in most creative endeavors especially something like a dj or something like a musical artist, you kind of have to be a bit self-absorbed, a little bit selfish to make it, right? You kind of have to think the world revolves around you in some way, shape or form in order to kind of have any kind of chance of kind of breaking through uh, the noise out there because there's tons of DJs, there's tons of cute DJs, there's tons of DJs with um, great skill, great social media presence who are willing and able to take a spot if you kind of rest on your laurels. So in one sense, I don't blame her. In another sense, I'm a little bit like, this is done in bad taste. So I stumbled upon her profile again the other day, just checking up and seeing what she's what she's been doing. And she made this post that I thought was just done in bad taste. Again, I've got nothing against it. She wants to share a picture of herself looking cute. Fair enough. But she decided to throw up like a TBT on Thursday of herself. Uh, like a picture of herself that someone took, I guess, of her, you know, think her looking cute. And somehow within this post, she kind of rationalized that it was a good idea to make a caption about the coronavirus. Like, about, oh, she's worried that her gigs are getting cancelled. And sometimes I look at I'm like, people are dying all around the world, right? It's a worldwide epidemic that's kind of now um, got everyone's attention, unfortunately, right? Because it's now kind of permeated across most of Europe. It's kind of trickled over into the UK. There's been cases reported now in America. The only places that hasn't been touched so far has been Africa for the most part. 
or uh, maybe Northern Africa has been touched. I don't know by the time of recording, but from not from what I know. So it's a big issue, right, that people are, are really worried about. And then she's using it as an opportunity to kind of complain that she doesn't want her set, her big paydays to get cancelled. It's just really done in bad taste. And so it's, here's a picture of it here on screen. Um, Nastya here with like a cute pose with her, you know, peace sign over her eye. I don't know. I don't know why that's relevant to post now. Not even post now. We'll, uh, post it if you want, but the caption doesn't make any sense. So the caption is the following. This is Nastya.dj on Instagram. I really hope this coronavirus madness will finish soon because I want my gig in Milan at wherever the place is called on the 14th of March. And I want to meet one of my favorite photographers um, who made these free shots in Italy amongst um, almost three years ago. All events are on hold now. Praying for positive change. Hashtag stop corona panic. Like, the whole caption is full of absolute dog shit, right? She's self-congratulatory, patting herself on her back for being cute, wanting to play this amazing place in, in Milan because it's obviously going to pay her pretty well. Again, I don't have any problem with that. Make your money, do what you want, cool. But in light of people dying around the world, is this the right time to kind of self-promote yourself and somehow make it about you? Like, this coronavirus isn't about you at all. It's got nothing to do with you whatsoever. It's happening around the world. It happens to affect your livelihood, but it's affecting everyone's life. People, people's family members are passing away, young and old, right? And then the bit at the end that doesn't make any sense too is the hashtag stop corona panic. What does that mean? Is she one of the is she one of the people in a camp who believes that the coronavirus is, not, is no more deadly than the common cold? Does she have a medical degree? Does she adopt the Donald Trump mantra that, oh, um, what do you call it, um, that he's not sold or he's not convinced of what the medical professionals are talking about when it comes to how serious a threat it is? Like, what does that even mean? It's just ridiculous, man. And I understand, obviously, most of these I've got from what Post Human has posted on Twitter recently, a thread. I get the impression that a lot of the bigger DJ, a lot of the DJs in general who are professionally who, who make their money DJing um, week to week, um, all year round, most of their monies are made by uh, touring, right? Going around the world. Which is why a lot of DJs had a big problem with about Brexit, especially the foreign ones, because they make more money going to other countries than they do playing in their own country, right? Which is just common sense. Fair enough. Um, but I also get this idea that you have to be socially aware, man. You're not you're not that detached from the world. You're going to play in front of hordes of normal people in clubs week in, week out. You're in an airport that sells newspapers and magazines. You see people walking around. You know, the airport's probably a good um a good kind of meeting ground to kind of meet people from all around the world with all different walks of life. It's not as if like she's a princess, right? From some royal family somewhere. She's just a DJ, right? It's not as if she's, you shouldn't be that detached from the world. And if it is that, it's kind of, you know, in, intentionally done to detach yourself. And obviously it's part of her as well. She doesn't care. She's just worried about her own pocket, which is, you know, again, um, it's, it's her own prerogative, but Jesus Christ, what bad taste has done it. But shouldn't be surprised though, innit? Because I, I think some people don't really like the fact that she does cry and complain and whine about stuff online too much. I quite like I like it, to be honest. I think it's pretty refreshing to have a DJ of her level speaking about the good and the bad of being a personal DJ. But also, I can understand in context, once you, once you, once you put it all in context, her personality in general, this vanity of this post, the, self, the, the, the narcissism of this post, the self-entitlement, um, it all just looks weird, isn't it? Once you add on top of it, oh my god, the sad glass and didn't go as I planned. It's like, okay, shut the fuck up. You know what I mean, you're just pressing Q and pause on a, on a, on a CDJ. Let's not be, let's not uh, get too ridiculous with it. Because I think the same thing about DJs who take DJing way too seriously. Like I view them in the same way, right? The same people that who you know view it as an opportunity to like self promote and showcase how cute they are. I look at them the same way as people who kind of like try and write dissertations about the effect music has on people and stuff like that, and how music can change the world. To be like, okay, rein your neck in, mate. I mean, let's re let's relax. But I don't know. That's probably her life in it. But yeah, um, Nastya out here being a bit nasty with all this shit. But anyway, what can you do? Let's move on with that one. I actually don't like these spots. I don't know what's happening. I've got these fucking annoying spots just out of my face. Yeah. Anyway, let's move on now. Let's get into some other interesting streetway news that I thought was more interesting to talk about. We're talking about Juice Rilla. Ba, 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 ba. What's we got here to talk about? Okay, so we've got the Nike. We've got this uh, collection from Size, actually, which is pretty interesting. We've got this cool. What's it called? Uh, Nike Air Max 95 from size. We've got two versions, right? We've got one version that's for... That I'm going to get up on, yeah? And another one that I think is really interesting too. Um, I think size that lately have been doing some pretty cool collaborations. Oh, no. Size for... the size? Yeah, it's, it is a size collaboration, right? Let me see if I got... If I got this right? 110 or the... I think it's size. Anyway, let's, let's double check. So anyway, there's two collaborations here that kind of take a nod to the UK culture, right? One collaboration with Size. I think Size in general 
have done some really cool collaborations the last few years. I think they haven't really missed so far. They're they're essentially like our version of Kif size when it comes to collab- collabs. They do them really well. They're very tastefully done. Uh, the drops are really you know are pretty painless. Um, the ordering process is pretty smooth. The stores are really well merchandised. The staff in there are really well knowledgeable. Are really knowledgeable, sorry. And it just seems as if, like, for a big corporation, for something that is a kind of the extension, is not size the extension of like JD Sports and stuff, right? I'm pretty sure, right? Um, they do a really good job at making it seem as if size is like a independent, a kind of a, an independent uh, sneaker store that made it big when really it isn't, right? Really, it's a kind of a, you know, it's a it's a well oiled machine. But I love the, that they give that kind of mom and pop kind of impression again. I know it's sacrilegious to say it. They're not an independent store. But I do get the feeling when I go into a size that I am surrounded by all the local kind of like um, influential sneakerhead kids that are in the scene at the moment. For the most part. I, mean, I know when I used to go to size, when I used to buy shoes in real life and go to stores and stuff and hang around Soho and try and look cool. I know that a lot of the kids working in there were people that I knew from forums and stuff. So I'm sure it's the same way nowadays. It has to be. Um, they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't necessarily employ someone like me to work in a shop but because I'm too old and I'm not really plugged in with the, the cool new kids. So they want people that are really plugged in, have a good Instagram following, um, you know, have good connections and shit because it'll make the store a bit more popping, especially when they have releases and stuff. So this collab- collaboration they just put out or details of it just got come released recently. Um, it's called So Size and Nike Air Max 95, a 20 for 20 inspired by past exclusives, right? A roll call to the uh, so this says the following um well a well-known uk retailer side is celebrating 20 years in the business which is awesome as part of the anniversary facilities is teen up with nike for a special air max 95 20 for 20 a true what the style the bold nike sports shoe draws from Ni- sizes 20 best exclusive swoosh brand releases for a rich not to two parties crab history so i'm assuming every crab they've done so far they put it all into one shoe I- i'm wondering why they decided to put it all on a Air Max 95. That's one thing. Maybe it's partly due to the fact that the other show I'm going to show you, the 110s are coming out. Um, that's an interesting choice to make, isn't it? Maybe because of the panels. There's more panels that you can kind of put on there. There's more panels that you can kind of edit, maybe. I don't know. Um, interesting choice. Um, with a veritable smorgasbord of tones, textures, and materials, 20 for 20 appears to be a true sportswear hodgepodge at first glance, but close inspection reveals a keen attention to detail. Lateral sides are kept traditional, using dark tones, while the blacks and greys plus a recognizable safari print. Uh, meanwhile, the medial sides offer the inverse, uh, swapping each piece in bold hues that run the garment with neon green to enrich purple, common threads on both feet are provided by light pink mesh overlays high vis reflective heels and jet black toe caps um so it's a video as well that kind of details a bit of the experience to see what it says here. of the best oh it's a video as well too. awesome nike exclusives on one pair of shoes that's pretty cool is it nike or size exclusive why are they showing pumas and shit it's probably nike only right let's wait here what do you hear what do you say 20 of the best ever size Nike exclusives okay, on size yeah. shoes. I don't know what it's showing non Nike shoes. The issues. first one of this pack dropped back in December. It was a black pair. We really love this idea of making something really customizable, really personal, and really unique to however you want to wear it. And you can essentially take off these patches and each pair will get random patches in the box and customize it. We nice. always wanted people to go out, create their own patches, create their own shoe. That was the whole point of it. We've seen a massive resurgence of DIY products and mm-hmm. people. Oh, those they're the the top, top shelf. Oh! They're really good and exciting. I think I might still have them in my mum's house, actually. They're so good. They've been making their own those patches. Those ones up there, up there, top left. People have had some Travis Scott Air Force Ones and they've stuck the swooshes on. We've seen loads of stuff on it. And it's that creative nature that we would encourage. So you've got eight patches in the box and also there's some limited edition things coming through in certain stores as well. It's just giving you the platform to essentially make whatever you want it to be. And what better way than to do it on a classic icon like the Chuck. Now this is the return of something classic. That's so the nice. Nike Air Zoom Spirit on Cage 2 from the early 2000s. I mean, we're seeing a lot more Zoom coming through. Obviously, we've seen on the Kipchoge Chu that uh, Zoom was incorporated into that. And it was almost a technology that was kind of dwarfed by another technology that Nike produced. 
I mean, away from the Zoom pieces, but it is just a great shoe. I mean, the, we've seen the 90s running thing coming through in the last few years, and for me, this is one of the better ones that's kind of come out of that. Yeah, massively. I mean, you see a lot of brands doing it. You, yeah, and really also, so, it's so journey, sweet. We've seen a few more really high energy and sort of really interesting collaborations on this. So I'm really confused. What is going on here? Is this all of the shoes that they're going to drop during a collaboration, or are these just shoes that they're interested in? I'm not really sure what's happening here. Maybe I'm confused. On this, so it's something for the see. summer, something we're really passionate and excited about to see come to life, and it's a. Uh, a nod to the celebration of our first store, we can tell you that for now. So, I think you just give a, a worldwide exclusive. That's wow, what you're nice. Here for, They're so sexy. Oh, so nice. For those of you who don't know, Fast Times of Ridgemont High is a film that was released in 1982 that kind of featured an anti hero. In the film, he unboxes a fresh pair of checkerboards, and, and this is kind of reference to that. This is actually a reference to a shoe that they kind of give away. Okay, so uh, I'm assuming they're all part of the, is they're all part of the pack. As the well, Pumas are there the too, going fast forward a little bit now, this don't want to watch the whole thing. And then the MX95 is the one thing. What better way to celebrate than to combine all those projects for one moment. And to finally see it come to life, especially when we've been part of a lot of the projects, has been amazing. So nice. And I took a brief forward to that, that we felt was potentially maybe a bit unrealistic. 20 of the best ever size Nike exclusives on one pair of shoes. We weren't sure we were going to get it right. This come back, first time first sample spot on yeah nice. so from the outside it looks very traditional in terms of really hard yeah. back to the original neon the inside were the real beauties but you can't neglect the outside because it's like we're saying there's 20 pairs of shoes in here Part of i actually like the fact that they shoes. decided to go for like an understated outside and then a uh, wild inner, inner side i quite like the idea that some you know some nike shoes have the thing where they don't have a swoosh on the instep i quite like that I know on some some brands wouldn't want that. They want their brand um, or logo to be visible on all angles. But I like the fact that you can be a bit understated on the instep. Someone could be like, oh, what are those? And then you kind of turn your foot to the side. Oh, shit, they're nice. Oh, they're here. I think that looks quite cool. And I like that. And I like the fact that with these shoes, essentially, you could get away with wearing them in an office that's a bit conservative because they're not allowed all the way around. They're allowed only on the sides that you can kind of see from the... They're allowed only on the sides that you, can, you can't see from the instep. So depending on what you wear and your outfit, you can kind of basically tone them up and turn them down. I think that's a pretty cool um, idea. You can't neglect the outside because it's like we're saying, there's 20 pairs of shoes in here. Part of the, the beauty of the shoe is that you can kind of spend your time guessing what which one's which. You can kind of see in there, we've got the, the blade, the footbed. You've got nice. a Dave White reference there with the airbag. I won't give any more than that. No, I don't think <laughs> it's didn't it? Because it's such a great shoe. Mini swooshes here. Yeah. Sweet. You get swooshes on the medial side and also on the lateral side in oh, there yes. as well. And you'll also get from the footbeds, a black and a white. Woo so the two blazers and also on the PSI. That's so nice. One, Hopefully they don't sell out so super quickly because I'd like a pair of yeah, these. Once it comes to life and you see some of the storytelling in a little bit more detail, all of it will start to reveal. There's lots of different layers to this project. But it'd be nice to see if you guys can comment below and tell us what shoes you think we're referencing on this. Yeah, they're so good, man. I can't wait to see what they look like when they come once they come out. And again, um, so we're back with Lip for the episode size previous for 2020. March installment takes a look at the much so after MS 2020, da, da, da. okay, so I'm not sure if all the other shoes are featured are part of it, but regardless, I think they will look incredible anyway. So that's going to be one amazing one. And then the next 95 I went to feature on the uh, video so far on its episode, it was these ones. The MS 95 110 as a nod to London street culture. Now, I like the idea that they're embracing the 110s, Monica, the, the kind of a slang term for Air Max 95s, because back in the days they were 110 pounds. Now I think they're probably a lot more. I'm not too sure. We're a long while time since I bought a pair of uh, a pair for retail price, but I do remember them being very popular, especially during the UK garage times, garage scene times. That was probably when I was still in secondary school. I remember a couple of my friends, a couple of my brothers, older, my couple of my older brothers' friends, when they used to go out, their kind of um, attire of choice was a kind of a long sleeve button up Armani shirt, maybe Ben Sherman, usually Armani Exchange, Ben Sherman, sometimes Versace, plain sort of like blue shirt with some nice black jeans or some nice blue jeans, straight, and then a pair of like Air Max 95 laced up to the top, like or laced a bit loose. Um, that was a really big look, especially the kind of classic colorways, right? The blues, the white with the blues, the kind of the, the classic neons, like all the kind of classic MS-90 colors that you're familiar with. They would just wear those and kind of rock out. So the MS-95 was kind of part of it. And the reason why they'd wear those was because at the time, they were one of the most expensive shoes to get. So it was a bit of a like, uh, it's equivalent to wearing like a pair of Balenciagas, right? Or whatever, or a pair of Christian Louboutins like the guys in the trap do now, or the guys from the hood do nowadays when they got their feet up all the time. But obviously with the 95, you got the benefit of like, because that's the benefit you've got with like trainers over kind of designer shoes. Designer shoes usually have an element 
that is makes them look expensive. So I don't know if it's an Alexander McQueen, like that stacked sole shoes, the sole of it, you don't want to cover them. So you wear skinny jeans. If it's a pair of Louboutins, you always kind of put your feet up so you can see the red bottoms. But with Air Max 95s, because they're such an iconic looking shoe from the pat, from the uppers to the midsole to the air bubble to just the, how the laces are, you can see it from afar. You know straight away someone's wearing a pair of 95. So you can tell exactly, okay, cool. That guy spent 110 pounds on his trainer. So for that kind of like um, comparison, sort of like don't watch face sort of like culture that existed at the, uh, 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 kind of garage nights and the fact that they're super comfortable and you could be on, the, you know, the dance floor skanking all night long um, is the best thing. Obviously, once you spell a bit of rum on the mesh, you're completely fucked because they're an uh, absolute bitch to clean. Um, anyone that knows them will know. Um, once you get them fucked up, it's kind of over. But apart from that, one of my favorite Air Max 90s as well from the collection. Probably not more so than Air Max 90, but still one of an actual go in that lineup. And I like that they're taking a nod from the 110s and putting it on the, I think it's on the label of the of tongue, actually. I think it's on the tongue and they put it on there. But let's read quickly the text from Hypebeast. Nike Air Max 95 110 nods to London street culture. It says, when Nike Sergio Lozano designed the Air Max 95 debut in 1995, it was dubbed the 110 by its avid UK fan base and not to its retail price in British pounds. Now in celebration of Nike's 20, oh, the 95 is the 25th anniversary. That's why I probably did it with size. And it's memorial monarchy. And Nike Sports has prepared a 95 110. It's private in London, offering currency-centric details. The 110 is a love letter to the city. Lozano layered upper panels are inspired by the human anatomy and allow for wide-reaching material experimentation. So there are so here they're dressed in everything from suede to elephant print to leather to athletically inclined mesh. The grey, white, tan, and blue color palette is an acknowledgement of the, of the Big Smoke's urban setting and memorable and memorable architecture. Sorry, uh, from cobblestone streets to concrete towers and bold brick homes. Um, but yeah, I'm a big fan of this shoe. I think this looks really cool. It came out really well. I love the lookbook. I love the fact that they've got some authentic London people to model them as well. It's done with in situ too. Um, great setting, great backdrop. I think that drop that look here with this guy wearing the neon sort of like track jacket with the Nike hat looks fucking banging. The colorways they're done really well, and again, all the models in it look really nice too. So really, really well done. A real eclectic cast of models who really kind of um, represent the Nike 95 in the right way. Um, so they're due to come out when 110s. They're going to approximately retail for 110 just for that kind of special release. There's no actual date on them right there at the moment. It's to be announced. So let's see. I think it's going to be March. I think they announced it already. Let's check Foot Patrol's um, Instagram. I think they announced it already. They're going to release them in March. I'm pretty sure I saw something about March. Okay, you got. Uh, let's see if I can find them here. What's this here again? DJ Mantra. I don't know what that is about. But yeah, I'm pretty sure I saw something about March. Right? Was it March? One, here's a closer look. Remember that the in store online power raffle are now live on the blog. Online. So sign up. Okay, so 6th of March. You can definitely check those out. So yeah. A really good shoe. I'm a big fan of. I think they're going to do really well. So definitely check those out if you're that way inclined. Um, some two great 95s coming out very, very soon for those of you that love your 95s. Let's move on. What else do we have here to talk about? Oh, we had the Nike Air Max. Uh, sorry, we had, a, we had the Supreme and Nike Air Force Ones, which have garnered a bit of attention. I think they're pretty much sold out on the online store at the moment. Now, I, unlike most people, are going to say that these are an excellent idea and I think that they're probably one of the best kind of Nike interpretation or Nike collaborations that Supreme have put together so far, very much on the money. Um, again, uh, Supreme have a very um, interesting history when it comes to Nike collaborations, right? Some of them miss, some of, some of them are hits, some of them are misses. But what I do like about Supreme is that they never choose the easy option. They always kind of choose really um, difficult silhouettes or silhouettes that are very much tied or are very much ingrained in New York streetwear culture. And if you're not a part of it, you wouldn't really get it. And the fact that Supreme is a global brand, for them to say that kind of a big risk is something that should be uh, commended, right? Something that should be applauded. But I also do think that when they do hit the collaborations, they have a really good way of um, representing or they have a really good way of choosing shoes that represent Supreme on the, glo on the macro level, on a micro and a macro level, right? On a global 
and a local level. And I think the Air Force One is one of those monarchies. Because I think if you've ever been to New York, if you know anything about New York streetwear culture or New York um, culture in general when it comes to sneakers, you know the Air Force One is the quintessential um, New York shoe, right? It was kind of dubbed, I think, back in the day. It was called the Uptowns. They had the, yeah, right? Um, or the, yeah, is it called the Uptowns? I'm pretty sure it's the Uptowns. They had a nickname for the Air Force One. Um, obviously, you hear people like ASAP Rocky talking about uh, the need for people to not wear mids. Mids have, have a bit of a weird relationship with people in New York. They sometimes are very much uh, strict about only wearing highs and lows. The fact that lows, especially black lows, are very much linked to uh, high crime. I remember at the time there was a period, I think in the UK too, there was a period in time where the Air Force One All Black was one of the prominent shoes that was getting... Um, put into evidence when it came to like house robberies and shit so i remember there being a list of shoes i think air max 95s are on there air force ones are on there too just the kind of the quintessential kind of comfortable shoe that you could kind of get up into someone's house and take all their shit and obviously on the other side you've got the air force one in white uh or the all white air force ones right um where they're essentially probably one of the only probably one of the most copied shoe silhouettes that's ever existed Every kind of high fashion brand has tried to kind of take that shoe and kind of take the DNA of it and apply it to their own silhouettes. Not to good effect. Maybe anyone I've seen so far is Phoebe Filo's iterations of the Air Force One mid in leather. That was pretty cool. But for the most part, the Air Force One white is basically seen as the kind of quintessential um, uh, kind of like, um, what do you call it? Uh, you know, you're kind of dressing up and dressing down like you can dress it up and dressing down really easily a pair of jeans all of a sudden it turns into a regular shoe uh you throw in a pair of uh, crisp uh suit trousers you know some isi miyaki pants isi miyaki blazer and a pair of fresh white air forces and suddenly now the air force one's been elevated and i think that's the real beauty of it so for supreme to decide to collaborate with with nike on an air force one in both a white low and a black low and then have it be something that kind of is going to be restocked frequently throughout the season similar to what they do with the Hanes t-shirts and the uh, boxer pants that come in all the time right i think this is pretty cool it, it just kind of makes it so that there is a base uh level essentials at supreme whether it comes from the backpacks that are usually the same sort of shapes or the messenger bags or whether it comes to the t-shirts and the undergarments and the boxes and the socks or maybe coming up soon i really like the idea i think it's really fresh and again very tastefully done now the only thing i would have done differently if it was me is how they purposely edit, made them a bit more custom. I think at the moment, the only custom thing we have is the debossed logo on the side, uh, on the side of the heel in black. And, and I think that's a good thing as well because what you've got, because it's a black and a white upper, you have the benefit of them using the logos that are pretty much more recognizable, the, the red and white, as opposed to the other kind of colorways that people don't really maybe spot from afar so that's pretty cool but if it was if it was if i was part of the process i would have maybe uh, opted for them to kind of maybe lux up the upper materials which might have impeded the fact that they can't make as many and they can't probably price them as cheap as they are now i think they're like 90 bucks or something so maybe i would have upgraded leather and made them a bit more lux a bit more um durable maybe a bit more premium that would have made it better but i think overall as a design or as an idea and as an execution i think they're absolutely beautiful um again uh, clean all white air force ones no nonsense no unnecess no unnecessary um um you know accruements on the eyelets no crazy insoles no dumb sort of like heel tab thing just clean white air force ones that i'm a big fan of and again you've got the addition if you want to go loud you've got the kind of uh, quintessential supreme branded uh red laces with the white text but so far and again you know the first thing i'm going to do is take off that lace jewel and just wrap them up really really nice i'm not sure the lace jewel has some sort of does the lace jewel have any any signal any signage on it is there some sort of like supreme thing on the lace jewel or is it just a standard a af1 thing i'm not too sure i can't really see on that picture but again i'm a big fan of it um eve says in the news supreme has worked with nike on a custom version of the air force one can you be say it's custom when it's always got a debossing on it i don't know and an insole Maybe you can. You probably can. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Now, exclusively for Supreme, the shoe features a full grain leather upper, which is just standard when you get in JD Sports, I'm assuming. Co branded footbread and lace lock. Okay, lace lock has got co branding on it as well. And a deep boss print logo on the heel. The Air Force One low will be offered in two colorways available. The Air Force One will be restocked regularly throughout. So in the UK, it's 95. EU is 110 euros. And in the US, it's 96 dollars. So really amazing entry point into supreme under 100 bucks you can get yourself a pair of air force ones with the supreme logo on the side and i'm pretty sure for people who are you know 
I'm pretty sure the kids out there are going to be making sure people are going to see the tag at the back of the hill. But I just think it's nice to have just like imagine you buy two pairs of each and have them in your wardrobe because Air Force Ones, especially the white pair, are probably a bit more versatile than maybe the black pair. Because some people aren't really a fan of wearing all black shoes, which I love. I'm a big fan of all black shoes. If anyone that knows me will know I have tons of all black shoes, you know, from fucking um, stuff like that, <laughs> from tassel loafers to runners. I love a good all black shoe. Um, but I guess all white pair. Just stick a couple um, on ice, wear one for your day to day, and you've got a really kind of you know you've got you've got like a, a basic shoe that you can get from JD Sports with a little bit of a added touch to it, a little bit added spice added to it with a Supreme branding on the side. And again, I think it's really one of their better collaborations we've done so far, and something that I hope we might see coming up later in the future. Who knows? They might decide to make a mid, they might decide to make a high. But I think introducing the Air Force One low, reintroducing it again to kids. And telling them, hey, this is a shoe that you should really care about is the one. Because I think, especially sneakerhead kids, they have the tendency to always be jumping from uh, the newer thing to newer thing. They're not necessarily that tied to like classic silhouettes. Maybe the only one they're really tied to model-wise is uh, the Jordan 1, right? Which is a bit of a safe option because all their favorite artists wear them. But sometimes going back to the archive, I think, you know what? Actually, I really like the Air Force One Low. It's one of the classic shoes that works really well. Most outfits, looks good on shorts, looks good with sweats, jeans, whatever. Um, I've never seen it's impossible basically to make Air Force One look bad unless you like choke them to death and even then I see people pull them off really well so a uh, really clever shoe really cleverly done and again uh, big up Supreme for just continually smashing it really innit no surprise there really in that regard so let's move on do, 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 do. what else we got here on the list is double check here before we move on da, 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 da. let's see here what's we got to say here um okay so we've got nike be true to your school dunks i keep talking about these i know because I'm, I'm i'm annoyed by the by the fucking um how do you say it? i'm annoyed by the by the engineered nature of the of this resurgence i just don't think it's legit i don't think it's real and it just annoys me a bit because i remember there was a time where you know nike and sportswear brands didn't listen to sneakerheads on purpose right they everything that we wanted retro then retro the opposite or when they did retro it, like the Air Max, like the Air Max Lite and the M and the Air Stab. I'm never going to forgive Nike for giving us that much, that shit of a fucking trainer, right? Let's see if I can get it. Uh, the Nike, Nike Air Stab. Like, how shit did this come out, man? Like, compared to the fucking OG, right? I'm still never going to forgive them for giving me this bullshit. So, this is the shoe that we all wanted. Like, th well, this, that's the shoe that Nike gave us, right? This, this horrendous, um, bulbous thing. The only thing that was great about it was obviously the Foot Patrol colorway that came out. That was amazing. Big up Steve Braddon for working on that. That was probably one of the best um, collaborations or best um, colorways of the S-Tab that they put out. But look at that shoe, right? The colorway is amazing, but obviously the shape of the shoe is fucking horrendous. And then let's look at an actual OG pair, right? An OG. Let's see. This is too vintage. And show you how beautiful they looked when they actually originally came out. Look at the shape on these bad boys. Look at that. Look at the shape on that. Look at the shape on that and look what they actually gave us. Look how beautiful that looks. And they gave us that fucking bulbous abomination beforehand. So that I'll never forgive Nike about. And of course, the Nike Air Max Lite, right? This is one of probably the most egregious ones that they ever did for us, right? The Nike Air Max Lite. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this bullshit, right? Look at that. Yeah? Paneling's all fucked up. It just looks like they used the same Air Max 1 tooling. They didn't really try that hard. And then you look, go on here and you type in OG, right? Or vintage right together and look what comes up look at this look what comes up here look how great this shoe looks look at that look at the difference in it look at look how beautiful it looks as an og the paneling looks different the shape is different they drop different they got a bit more of an aggressive shape they look so beautiful don't they as an actual og but the shoe that we actually got was terrible so nike have a tendency of doing that sort of thing like look at that retro look at that look at that it looks fake doesn't it that's from an actual nike store that looks fake doesn't it that legit looks fake 2007 oh jesus i can't get a ray about this stuff anymore but anyway, let's move on so um i know i talk about the nike dunk be true to your school thing a bit too much on here but um i just feel as if it's like it's been engineered and they're trying to make us like something that we don't like anymore because everyone buys jordan ones they're trying to capitalize on it i don't know i just feel as if they they, they kind of used virgil's cosign to kind of make us believe dunks are coming back in but they're not really the only person that's wearing them is fucking travis really in it on that big of a scale and maybe offset or something like that's it i don't really see anyone wearing them day to day at all zero even if you look at street style pictures which is a really good indication of what people are actually wearing 
because a lot of people wear their actual trainers because they're walking around from show to show, showroom to showroom. They're not going to wear the, the free seated shoe just for the look, right? They're going to actually wear the shoes that they feel more comfortable. And you don't see people wearing fucking Nike Dunks. But anyway, Nike are going to continue pushing it because, you know, they can do that. So this is Nike revisits the Dunk Low, be true to your school pack. And this time they're doing them in a low, which is a little bit more interesting, I guess, because the fact that, you know, the Dunk Nike Dunk SBs are coming back into vogue. Maybe the lows are a safer bet for people, maybe closer to an Air Force One than they are to a Jordan One. I don't know, but I quite like how they look, don't get me wrong. Um, I wouldn't necessarily wear them, but I'd still think like, you know, I don't know. There's other things that want to be retro as apart from a dunk. And you know, it's going to end up on a cell rack anyway, but let's, let's go through them. So it's an article from Hypebeast it says the following. Nike is taking a quick breather from the crazy collaboration to celebrate the 35th anniversary of the classic Dunk Low Silhouette, uh, reviving two quintessential iterations from the Beach Studio School pack, offering a model in two-tone varsity blue and orange blue uh, blaze colorway, so, colorway. Sorry, The beloved low-top model arrives in a neutral white leather base and distinct color blocking in either blue or orange. Details include the perforated toe boxes, the thin mesh tongue, while compl complementing branding hints uh, land on the panel sushi's tongues stay tongue tags and heels a white midsole with hints of orange or blue outsole make for a comfortable wear finely tied together with tonal laces for a clean finish yeah so again i'm not bothered hundred dollars obviously probably a bit of an easy buyer for some people but i just think that it's just a wasted part of a collaboration no one's really wearing them it's all kind of engineered it seems kind of fake and again i'm just not really with it the sear chris the sear chris colorway though is fucking fresh that white orange one is really nice i'd love to have a pair of those and just kind of maybe muck around them and customize them a bit change maybe uh the paneling colorways on one shoe kind of do a bit of a flip on them but again i just don't i don't know maybe because i lived through it and i kind of went through the dunk thing when that was an actual thing um and they weren't that great of a shoe really to wear i think they look more they look dunks look better on the shelf than they do actually worn i'm gonna go out there and say that and i think dunk highs look better worn with shorts like i just think they're, they're probably the best version if you wear them with shorts I think it looked pretty cool. Um, but I think as is, I, there's tons of shoes I'd want to wear before I'd wear a pair of Dunks again. And there's nothing that's been, I've been sold on so far. Maybe apart from the Vitex and the Plums, they look pretty cool. But I don't know, man. I'm a bit I'm a bit over the whole Dunk thing. Because, okay, again, maybe because I have the privilege of living through that era. But I also think because it's just, it just feels too engineered for me. It doesn't feel organic. I, I, I feel like I'm being played. I mean, maybe it's just me. But anyway, let's move on for that one. Let's move on from that one. Let's keep on going. Keep on going. Keep on going. Um, so, next one here. We've got the Nike Air Force One. Um, with Comme des Garçons, which is a crazy color lab. It looks really, really cool. So, this debuted, I think, for the Fall Winter 2020 collection at Paris Fashion Week. And what I like about Comme des Garçons is that they always do crazy collabs no sorry they always do collaboration with nike but they always take like really staple silhouettes and do some crazy shit with it and i like the idea that that most of the crazy shit they do with it is done in a very crazy fashion way like you know most collaborations sometimes they do with nike it seems they just go in there and just change the paneling colorways and stuff they don't necessarily apply their fashion perspective or apple or kind of put a way of working to the shoe so you know i like the fact that you know sakai is the same sort of thing right that's why the sakai's have gone crazy i think because they look like a shoe that's been designed by a fashion designer right the fact that they've kind of she's kind of taken the uh, quintessential nike running shoe and essentially kind of stacked loads on top of it different soles different applications on top um kind of twisted that bended that it's something that you would have seen applied uh, to a runway show right taking like a staple trench coat and kind of deconstructing it uh, maybe elongating the sleeves taking away the waistband uh shortening the length of it uh doing another bit of lining like all those things have been applied to a shoe so i think when they're done right it can really kind of hit out of the park and i think um comedy also do a good way of doing it and i like the fact that they usually do them um, in a very small run they're only really released in their own stores in dover street around the world and they're kind of done without any hoopla no hype no craziness that's it and just gets put out there but i think these air force ones might be probably one of the most popular versions so this air force one for people listening it's level one mid um in white and black and then what essentially it looks like it's like they've basically taken an exact tone knife and slit along the kind of the the where the lace stays are they slit around the, the swoosh slit around the forefoot which essentially gives it this kind of exploded kind of like burst out sort of like style and then they've got the comme de garçon uh embossed on the strap on the side where the kind of velcro strap is so again very classically done very clean nothing extra on top of it just that and it looks 
fucking incredible. So this is from um, Heist Nobiety. It says, Comme des Garçons, new Air Force One mids are very on brand. It says the following here on the article, Comme des Garçons and Nike uh, uh, unveiling an upcoming collaboration at Paris Fashion Week. Um, name a more iconic trio. Over the past weekend, Comme des Garçons unveiled a Nike Air Force One mid on the Paris Fashion Week runway. The sneaker looked to uh, be crafted from premium leather and feature CDG branding on the customary ankle strap. As we, as was, as also, as was also the case with the Japanese uh, labeled previous Nike collaboration, these Air Force Ones feature a surplus of materials around the swoosh, heel strap, and toe box. Instead of frayed fabric, though, Nike mid feature excess of leather. The com- so is it excess of leather or is it an exact on that cut? I'm not too sure. Maybe it's excess leather. They're right, true that one. Maybe there is leather underneath it. Um, take a closer look at the sneakers via the Instagram below. So this is via Instagram of a guy called uh, what is it called? Lukaki uh luca kulibaki or something like that but i'll, I'll look at show notes so you guys can see yourself but they look fucking good man really really good so um i like that they got the more person at the bottom here but yeah so you got this kind of exploded look on them they look pretty cool they look so nice aren't they i love that sneaker so yeah maybe they're right maybe there is just excessive materials just like kind of like overlapping on it but i like the fact it's just a classic air force one uh mid done in white and black someone else i think there's a picture as well i put here i saw of like the the black pair yeah so this is the one that's actually got the actual look of them so again maybe i'm i'm wrong with the exacto knife thing maybe it's just excess material yeah it's excess material so then so there is a material underneath and it's just essentially them imagine you are gonna cut out a swoosh for a nike and you didn't want to go around it properly that's what it basically looks like but it looks really cool i love the look of it, it looks amazing you guys excess material and the black and the white it's just perfect perfect and again, I like the fact that that's what Supreme probably would have done, should have done with their one, but of course it would have cost them more money and it would have probably uh, reduced. They probably would have taken away the idea that they could restock them during the season, but I would have liked more Lux leather. Just looking at the black pair, you can tell the black pair has that more of an upgrade on leather than the standard uh, leather you'd get on an uh, Air Force One uh, that you get from JD Sports. It's a bit more, I don't know, it looks a bit more buttery. And I like the fact that they've got the white, you know, black on white text there. So it's a nice bit of floss if you're going to wear them with shorts. But they look fucking cool. I like those. They look really, really well done. Um, Image of surface. No date on the cl- on the no um, indication when they're gonna release so far. But again, one of my favorites that I've seen so far from Nike from um, this four two sorry the four twenty twenty shows in Paris. There wasn't that many sneak collaborations actually dropped this time around. But I like that these are out and they exist. So they look really cool. Again, another kind of uh, iteration of what Matthew Williams did with his Air Force ones as well. Really, really well done, man. I like the look of those. I can't wait for those to come out. Um, I think that might be it, isn't it? What else we got here to talk about? Let's go again. Yeah, I think that's it, man. I think that's it. That's the Action Zing Show episode number 289. I want to leave it there. Loads of streetwear news I kind of uh, included there. I'm going to add some more later on as we continue. As per usual, if you listen via the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review and share the show with your friends. If you're watching via YouTube, please smash that like button, um, hit subscribe, leave me a comment, let me know all your thoughts about the show. And if you have any questions for me, of course, you can reach out via Instagram. Check that out down below too. Reach out to me via Twitter. Follow me, AgsNoZinger or one word accent single one word and you can also check out down below my soundcloud for my dj profile where i upload all my dj mixes and stuff so you can find that on there too it's dj handsome black man all one word find that on there and until then i'll see you guys very very soon take care be safe um obviously if you're gonna party make sure you party safe is that a good thing to say to people yeah pretty sure and until then see you guys very very soon take care bye peace